Thank you very much. Thank you. Now for something completely different. I was asked to talk about the network the world needs. The word network might suggest to you the idea of infrastructure or maybe more like this. Um, but I'm not going to talk about this kind of infrastructure. The fear was I might use the word network neutrality in that conversation, and that wouldn't be appropriate. So I'm going to talk about a different kind of network. You might think a network like this. But I frankly don't understand the dynamic of these networks. So quick are they to transform that I'm not going to talk about these networks either. Instead, I want you to think about network in the sense of a platform. And the platform here is the platform for connection and exchange and understanding each other and cultures around the world. I mean you to think about this idea of network in the sense of infrastructure. That's why I'm using this weird New Deal-like font here. But infrastructure not in the sense of a physical infrastructure, but in the sense of a logical infrastructure. And if it's not too oxymoronic, let me suggest a logical infrastructure in the sense of a legal infrastructure. A legal infrastructure in the sense of rules that would enable this connection of this platform to build the network that, in my view, the world needs. Now, in understanding this connection, I think we need to think about different kinds of connections, and I want to talk about two. The first is suggested by something that Aldous Huxley wrote in 1927. He wrote, in the days before machinery, men and women who wanted to amuse themselves were compelled in their humbled way to be artists. Now they sit still and permit professionals to entertain them by the aid of machinery. It is difficult to believe that general artistic culture can flourish in this atmosphere of passivity. About a decade before, this man, John Philip Sousa, essentially said the same thing. He said, these talking machines are going to ruin the artistic development of music in this country. Sousa was testifying before the United States Congress about this technology, talking machines. As he testified, when I was a boy, in front of every house in the summer evenings, you would find young people together singing the songs of the day or the old songs. Today you hear these infernal machines going night and day. We will not have a vocal cord left, Sousa said. The vocal cords will be eliminated by a process of evolution, as was the tale of man when he came from the ape. Now, this is the picture I want you to focus on, this image of the young people together singing the songs of the day or the old songs. This is a picture of culture. We could call it, using modern computer terminology, a kind of read-write culture. It's a culture where people participate in the creation and the recreation of their culture. In that sense, it's read-write. Sousa's fear was that we would lose the capacity to engage in this read-write creativity because of these, quote, infernal machines. They would take it away, displace it. And in its place, we'd have the opposite of read-write creativity, what you could call, using modern computer terminology, a kind of read-only culture. Read-only in the sense that creativity is consumed, but the consumer is not a creator culture in this sense top-down, where the vocal cords of the millions of ordinary people have been lost. Now, if we look back at the 20th century, at least in what we call the, quote, developed world, it's hard not to conclude that John Philip Sousa was right. Never before 
in the history of human culture had its production become as concentrated, never before as professionalized, never before had the creativity of ordinary people been as effectively displaced and displaced for exactly the reason he said, because of these infernal machines. The 20th century was this unique century of read-only culture against a background from the beginning of time of read-write creativity. So if we think of kinds of cultures and distinguish between read-only and read-write, I suggest you think of the 20th century as the read-only century. And why was it so? Well, the answer is largely technical. It's the technology of broadcast, the technology of vinyl, that produces a culture where the interaction of people to this culture is this passive couch potato interaction. This technology enabled an efficient consumption of culture, reading, but inefficient production of culture in the sense of ordinary people writing. At least that was true with what we call media. It wasn't true, of course, with text, nor was it true with images we think of as photography. Indeed, think about the century before the 20th century. In 1839, this man, Louis Daguerre, invents this technology, the daguerreotype, producing what we would think of as photographs today. That was an expensive technology, and the market for daguerreotypes was small but growing. Then in 1888, George Eastman produced the Kodak. The Kodak, of course, was an inexpensive technology, and after the inexpensive technology was introduced, the market for capturing and sharing images exploded. So the ability to read photographs, consume them, was overtaken by the ability to write photographs, to produce them. Photographs were read-write in this sense. So the point I want you to think of right now is just with respect to certain forms of expression, text, it was read-write. Images, the 20th century was read-write. With respect to other forms of expression, music and film technologies, were read-only in the 20th century. The 21st century is going to be radically different. And we get a clue of that difference by mapping the evolution we've already seen in the way culture gets spread and shared. I think of this in three stages. The first stage around circa 2000 is a stage where technology extends the read-only culture of the 20th century. Massively efficient technologies enabling people to get and consume culture produced elsewhere. This is the poster child for this image of culture. The Apple uh, Music Store, the iTunes Music Store, enabling you to download for 99 cents any song you'd like to your iPod, of course, only to your iPod, but you're guaranteed, at least in this culture, to be cool if you engage in this form of cultural consumption. This is the picture, as my colleague, uh, Professor Goldstein, put it, of the celestial jukebox, where at any time, anywhere, you can buy culture to be consumed, a critically important part of both the last 10 years and the next 50 years in the way culture gets made and shared, driving an important and valuable part of this industry. But beginning around 2004, we're beginning to see a different kind of culture, a revival of what Sousa was speaking about, the read-write culture. The poster child for this maybe is something like Wikipedia, but the particular flavor I want you to think about is what I call remix. 